Good morning, and thank you for joining us in this uh, wonderful scenery here in Antwerp. So we're living in very interesting times. I think we are on the brinkmanship of phenomenal change in our society. And we see this happening more and more as we read the news every day, that we really start feeling that the ground under our feet is actually shifting. Now, how did it all start? Well, the started it with a good story. Uh, this picture right behind you shows you how the internet cable are currently connecting the world. We have never been so connected like we are right now. We have more spending in infrastructure and the ability for us to communicate as a society than spending in military. It's the first time in history where the spending on infrastructure is, tends to be outnumbering, outperforming the spending on military. That's phenomenal. It means that the world has understood at first that from the uh, divergence of the 20th century, we really came together and became a global village. This is by the nature how we buy our things, by the fact that the global economy is connected to each other, uh, by understanding that what happens here today in Belgium has an implication repercussion around the world, no matter where we are, and vice versa. You can argue that the world has become really a converging world. But in 2016, we uh, were actually woken up with the news that the world was shaking under that new order. And we have gone through two major shocks in the Western hemisphere. The first one, of course, was the Brexit vote, in which the country who created the Commonwealth was deciding to move away from the only things that keeps them competitive, which is the single market. And the second thing was that the United States, after a long period of time where check and balances were defined by the two major parties, decided to go towards uh, the anti-establishment with uh, Trump. Now, this was really the beginning of the change. We started to understand that the world was no longer that happy place in which euphoria was driving our performance, but it was really a place where more and more people were feeling disenfranchised and unhappy. Now, why has the 2016 something to do with what happened before? Well, you have to consider that historically, we decided to converge more and more production so that now you could actually get your stuff produced around the world at the fraction of the price. So your generation doesn't own as much as your parents, but you can buy more things in terms of the physical material goods. And this is because things are produced at a fraction of the cost somewhere, take for example China, and transport you over through logistics. So at the end of the day, even a clicker like this might have gone through 15 to 20 countries before getting into my hands. And that has really decreased significantly the cost of production. But not everybody was really impacted positively by this, because if you consider what has really made this possible, is a combination of two major axes. The first one is geopolitically, we became convergent. The second thing is that suddenly technology became the unexpected consequence. What you see here is really a conversation about how technology in the third industrial revolution really changed everything. We start to increase our production. It was easier for us to produce, as I mentioned before, at a fraction of the cost. Now, in highly efficient society, why do you need people in the first place? Well, the answer is we need people because we should never forget that we have to maximize human-centered society. But in the mindset of economic uh, uh, maximization, uh, people might be a cost that you can easily replace by using technology technology as a surrogate to that. So the increased amount of technology was making our society more efficient. The fact that we're actually becoming more and more dependent on each other started to show some cracks. And those people that were not part of the global economy, they start feeling angry. It's just to give you a point of reference, most of the election that we have in the 20th century were driven primarily by joy. So if you take an example like the Vietnam War, after the Vietnam War in the 70s in the US, people were voting for joy, euphoria, hoping and looking forward to something that has still to happen. But in 2016, the primary motive of the election was actually fear and anger. So, how did we get there? Well, the idea is really that we have forgotten that technology by itself tends to be discriminatory by the fact that it's trying to marginalize the weakest links. Therefore, on one hand, you have high productivity where you have in country that are producing extremely high. GDP tends to be uh, the tricky measure where more and more this tends to be going towards uh, labor productivity output that tends to be very high but the family income was not growing at the same time. Just to give you a point of reference, which has been captured by many different scholars, the, uh, the, working, uh, the working wage uh, converted by inflation is right now in some part of the world the same as 1972. But if you're looking at the productivity that we have, we of course have a major gap between where productivity goes and family income. And that is a problem, because if you start noticing that in your life you can't move on, you have no incentive, there is no mobility, as a matter of fact, you start feeling disenfranchised, you start feeling marginalized, you start feeling angry. So for you to understand how did we fragment, 
We fragment it by first becoming convergent, by generating this extreme euphoria about becoming a global uh, scenario. From there, we started to know that the technology was marginalized in some part of the territories. This is why, if you're looking at the digitalization of countries that went into the anti-establishment vote, there's a correlation between how digital you are and where you would vote. So quick example, the United States coastal part, so you take East Coast or West Coast, of course they voted for uh, the Hillary Clinton uh, proposition because they were part of the global economy. Who didn't vote for them were people in the Midwest or in the Rust Belt where we wouldn't, really didn't feel part of the global economy. You take Brexit, uh, the southern part of the UK decided to remain. Why would they not, since London is actually a global place, but the rest of the country that were not integrated as much decided to leave. It shows you that digitalization, if it's not properly democratized, uh, made accessible and scaled uh, to the mainstream level, it become a force of fragmentation. So we talk about fragmentation because from the good news about having become global, we have forgotten that there are consequences that are becoming quite a daunting for us to take care of. Now, if you're looking at what has really happened towards the same period of time, is that we have increased exponentially growth. So we're now going from incremental to exponential, very soon to quantum. So the ability for us to forecast the future tends to be compromised by the fact that we're shifting away from binary systems all the way to exponential model. Exponential model that cannot be uh, easily normalized. You cannot use bell curves to determine this. You cannot have a delta to determine the distance between the probability distance between variable A and variable B. Therefore, as you're shifting into exponential model, we tend to be unable to forecast what happened. The reason why you don't have any certainty on forecasting what will happen tomorrow, primarily because tomorrow is no longer a marginal optimization of the past. It is actually an entirely different story that tends to be hardly captured by traditional macroeconomic indicator. As an economist, I can prove that to you because most of our theory is bound on rationality and numerical dimension, but the life we live these days is hardly rational and it's hardly binary. At the same time, jobs have become more and more exposed to being replaced. Why? Well, if you have a job that was defined in the 19th century and early 20th century, where you had some degree of mechanistic capacity, it's very easy to think that the job eventually will move away. So what you see in your slide right behind me is the type of job exposed to a, a replacement, displacement, or redundancy by the fact that we had a lot of repetition in this job. So one of the things I ask, as you know, I teach at Harvard, so when I am at Harvard and I'm asking my students, how many of you work uh, in a job where you have in repetition? Well, the answer I'm receiving is 30, 40, 50 percent. And ask yourself the same question. If you have in a number as an answer that goes beyond 30 percent, well, clearly that is, from an economic perspective, a job that can be replaced. It doesn't mean it's from a societal perspective the right things to do. But remember what I mentioned to a good friend of mine last night, economics always wins. No matter how much we try to fight it, if you have an economic rationale, you can hardly fight it with a societal one. Therefore, we have to own the conversation at the early stage. But today, it's not about telling you how bad the world has become. It's by, by now, we know about it. We all feel and fear the world has become a different place. It's to show you that there is an opportunity, uh, as Magali said before, introduced by the dome of the fourth industrial revolution, which is really changing primarily the role of technology in our society and changing primarily tenets such as our relationship to life, our relationship to work, and our relationship to the planet. We are facing, as a 21st century society, challenges that we never faced before. Therefore, looking at the past, trying to address in the future challenges, like driving a car by looking at the rear mirror. We can't can't do that. So we have to understand that in the rise of the fourth industrial revolution, which is a concurrent revolution, it's not replacing the third, it's up at the same time, we really have an entirely different way for the integration of digital, biological, and physical to work together. And this is where I see the opportunity of what can be the under theme of this conference on where the new renaissance is really coming from. I like to tell you that technology in the fourth industrial revolution is not the enemy. Technology is only there to make sure that we can free ourselves from those type of tasks designed in the 20th century that has us working as productive uh, units rather than working as what make us actually special, which is our ability to contextualize, to generate creativity, to work with people, to become an interfacing with people, to create empathy. You know, our job, when they're bound by job description, they almost look at us like a factor of production. This is why it's so easy to replace us. But in the fourth industrial revolution, we are freeing ourselves from those type of jobs, and we're moving into a different kind of definition of job. It's the 
those type of jobs that really maximize human well-being. So we like to imagine that, of course, uh, we are moving away from cost and productivity on one side, thinking as technology becoming a, a, a vector of opportunities. And in the work I do in artificial intelligence, I have co-founded a, a, a company on AI called Nexus Frontier Tech. The type of work we do really say, how do we maximize the opportunity for people to use technology to discover correlation they, never, uh, they could never discover by themselves, and then using the time for new meaningful connection. See, we are right now at the very beginning of an opportunity, which is my message for you in trying to shift from the age of fragmentation to the new renaissance. The new renaissance is really coming with the fact that we're shifting again the language about how we are as a society. We're becoming much more driven by the fact that it's not wholly specific or very specialized, but very generic, generic and very generalist as well. We have to know a little bit of everything. Formal education will not give us employability anymore. It will give you the opportunity to have a conversation, so it's still good for you to take your degrees, but don't expect your degree to be the reason why you should have a job, because this is not the way it works anymore. The degree are a prerequisite for you to start having a chat with somebody. And then how you make, how you work your life through is really defining the opportunities. At the same time, we see more and more the fact that purpose is becoming more and more important. I think right now we're discovering that we need to have a new collective story for us to believe in what really will be our society in the 21st century. We have been very naive thinking that you can simply transfer the value of the 20th century over to the 21st one. But you know what, guys? We are very different. We have become a different generation. We don't have the same need for us to be part of the free market economy that supposedly is working for everybody because we have seen the end of the specific system as, in my own lifetime, population double. Therefore, we are dealing with a degree of variability, volume, velocity, and complexity that we've never seen before. I'd like you uh, to, to think and take away from my conversation something about the new Renaissance man. We had this already back 500 years ago. It was the polymath man. It was the fat and woman, of course. It was the fact that now we're having this individual capable of arranging different type of conversation, spanning boundaries across so that it's not only bound to a role, but you can think of your life as a journey of iteration so that you can start developing yourself as you actually grow older, rather than thinking that you're going to be so like con condense and concentrate into only one role. It's thinking about the fact that we're going to redesign our relationship with the planet in a way that tends to be within our planetary boundaries. There is no trade-off between economic opportunity, social integration, and planetary boundary. Whoever comes up and tells you this is still actually anchored to the 19th, cent 19th century and 20th century, where our economic model, we're still thinking about the fact that you must have a trade-off between becoming profitable and the respect with the environment. In this side of the world, you understand it. In North America, we struggle a lot to understand this. Canada does understand it. The United States does not yet understand it for a number of different reasons. It's because I think we have historically seen a, a normal compromise. But I'm here to tell you that in the generation of the new Renaissance man, this polymathic person, that this degree of balance we're having in managing different type of complexity without the need for us to specify this with one single answer, we have the opportunity to really think about redefining the foundation of our society. And I'd like you to um, uh, come back from this talk, especially as the starting talk with the responsibility of setting the tone for some of the conversations I'd love you to have in your head. So we have primarily two choices ahead of us, and so for you guys to start feeling the urgency. One is that we are waiting for somebody else to fix it, and I have news for you, they won't fix it for us. They can't fix it because this is of a much larger scale and magnitude than what we ever had in our history. We are that civilization that has to figure out the bridge between what happened before and what will happen in the future. Uh, teaching uh, what worked for you to your children will not give them more advantages, but telling them that you trust them, that you love them, that you give them confidence, that you trust them even if you don't know what they will do, will probably will give them much more mileage than before. So as a final message to you today, you know, you have two opportunities. One is that you're going to be bystanders of our, our uh, society, looking at what happens ahead of you. But as I told you before, I think we deserve much more than this. Or, which is really what I'd like you to become, become the architect of our new infrastructure. Make sure you're becoming the contender to the future you actually have. Make sure you're looking at yourself as that conversation where the ownership of the type of society you want to have will really actually happen through your daily work. 
It doesn't have to be from, from governments, from, from uh, important people. It has to start at the grassroots level, where the conversation in which you're redefining the nature of the job, redefining the nature of the conversation, making sure that you move away from a zero-sum game, shifting into a much more positive-sum game. So where you're thinking about creating value without feeling that you're bound to a compromise to be who you want to be, to become a society integrated through inclusiveness, and to live in a world where we can be within our planetary boundary. Thank you very much, Ted at Antwerp.